Uh, happy Tuesday. Nice to see you. Uh, God providentially put you in the world as, as part of the pattern of God's new creation. You're here for a reason. You have a mission in life. That mission was given to you by God. And so when you do your work, I hope, and hope you're thinking about this between the today, yesterday and today, because we talked a little bit about the, the point in time that Jesus shifted things. You're part of the shift. right? So, so what you do, whatever it is that you do, and maybe you don't work now. Maybe you're on, on vacation or maybe you've retired. Uh, maybe you're still caring for uh, children or maybe you're caring for parents. But whatever it is, you have been called into the world at this time by God. Right? Around relationship. Relationship with Jesus and relationship with your neighbors. So we see now, let's pick up on verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Passover, the Jews did not want bodies to be left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath, Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies taken down. This actually, oddly, was an act of mercy because the way people die on the cross is their, their arms or hands are nailed to the cross beam, but then their feet just barely touch this little board that's there. And it's sort of like when you're in a swimming pool and you're just in the deep end and you're on your tippy tippy toes and you're sort of like bouncing and trying to breathe, right? That's, that's what it's like. And sometimes these people on these crosses could live for days like that, just suffering, right? So oddly, breaking the legs was an act of mercy to speed the death. And then they come to Jesus and it says, Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who were crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. And they did not break his legs. As it says in the Psalms, not one of his bones will be broken. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with his spear, and at once blood and water came out. And then it goes on to say, verse 35, He who saw this has testified, so that you may believe his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth. So the point of this sparing, in addition to being a reflection of talking about his side pierced in the Psalms, it says he's dead. He's full dead, right? His, his blood and plasma had already begun to separate. There's no mistake about it. Jesus is not alive, right? They pierced him. And not only did they pierce him, which might have killed him, but they also indicated that his body was already breaking down. These things occurred, verse 36, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken, quoting the Psalms. But just like the Paschal Lamb uh, in the book of Exodus, chapter 16, where it says that, do not break any of the bones of the sacrificial lamb. Verse 37, and again, another passage of Scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Verse 38, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea who was a disciple of Jesus as though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, remember him. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, in, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing a hundred pounds. Huge gift. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloth according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where Jesus was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. It was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And Jesus' body was put there, and it was close by. Uh, as I said the other day, under the church, the roof of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre includes both Golgotha and the garden. It's hard to know what kind of garden it is, right? Maybe we think it was a beautiful English garden. We know it's not. It was just a place that was probably not particularly good for um, cultivating um, any kind of food. Uh, and so they hew out tombs uh, from the wall of the quarry 
uh, and flowers and whatnot, trees grew up in that space. And Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus have moved, right? They've shifted from the old creation where they were part of the infrastructure and the hierarchy of Jewish, the Sanhedrin and power to a place of, of, of um, relationship with Jesus being the most important thing and willing to sacrifice all they had as people saw what they were doing and make no mistake about it, this was not a hidden action, right? But they said at this moment, they had seen the person that they weren't sure if he was gone shift things. So in their heart, they felt a shift. That's what happens in the death of Jesus Christ. We are called to see God doing something extraordinary for us, God honoring our freedom. And so how has God honored your freedom? How has that shifted your perspective? How has that shifted the way you see things? Jesus died for you here. And we have the capacity, like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, to respond. How are you going to respond to the death of Jesus Christ and the freedom that God has given us? Think about it. Pray about it. I'm praying for you. I love you. Peace upon your souls.